Uh, George, in your recent book, uh, Good Money, which is excellent, by the way, uh, you explained how for about a 40 or 50 year period, in the absence of any central bank coinage in Britain, that the marketplace quickly and effectively filled the void. And I'm wondering from that experience, what lessons should we draw that might be useful in shaping uh, the kind of monetary reform I think most of us would want to see? What can we learn from that period that we should apply? So, uh, well, let me, let me kind of answer a little obliquely by saying why I wrote the book. What I thought the main thing was, uh, the main lesson was. You see, uh, I spoke earlier about, you know, comparing uh, uh, Bernanke to the Wizard of Oz and all that. I spoke about the mythology of the Fed. And we could also, I could speak as well about the mythology of central banking more generally. At the bottom of this mythology, this view that these institutions are absolutely essential, that we can't live without them, and that they're all powerful and all good. But at the very bottom, if you dig, dig, dig deep enough to try to find the roots of these beliefs, you get to the uh, ancient laws prescribing uh, private coinage. That's where it all starts, with governments uh, asserting and establishing the prerogative of coinage, only we, the prince, the government, the king, whatever, the tyrant, only I or we can coin money. That is the basic, uh, what you might call the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, the Ur myth, you know, this is, this is where it all starts. And out of that grows, out of that grows this, you have this gradual incrustation of new powers where governments go from there to asserting their right to monopolize paper currency, and then their right to control banks and bank deposits, right? I mean, more broadly. And we have people now talking about how shadow banking should be regulated, and, and it never ends. So I wrote the book to say, wait a minute. This starting point for all this myth is, it's, is false. It isn't true that you can't have private coinage uh, or that private coinage can't work better than government coinage. Because the myth rests on the assertion that you need to trust us with only us with the coinage because otherwise it's going to be so much worse. Right? And so that's why I wrote the book to say, well, what happens when on, on those rare occasions or one of them when the government steps aside and, and tolerates private coinage? And what happens is the private coiners show the government a thing or two about how to do it right. Okay. So, um, uh, so that's why I wrote the book. What lessons can you draw from this? Well, I think the, the big lesson, as I've said, is that uh, we, we, the big lesson is that our beliefs about government's role in money are founded on myths, including that starting myth. And that we need to, first of all, understand that. That way we can start to go to work in a, in a rational way trying to think of what we should do to our monetary system because we're not going to do a good job if we're operating on the basis of myths instead of truth. Uh, and so uh, the, next, the next thing, that, the other thing that the lesson teaches us of is something I think we need to understand. Every positive innovation concerning money, whether it's the creation of coins themselves or the development of bank deposits and banknotes or electronic money or cryptocurrencies, there's no such thing as, a, as an innovation, a good one, concerning a, a, a currency that has come from the government. Well, private markets are the only source of all the positive developments in money, many of which have been destroyed or ruined by the government pouring in and botching them up. But, but the private sector knows how to not only make money, make a medium of exchange, but how to make better and better money over time and we find out better ways to produce media of exchange, new innovation. <laughs> and uh, certainly you see the dynamism of the private sector suppliers of coin in this episode and how smart they were. And that's the other lesson. Uh, Israel Kirzner, I'm very happy to be able to invoke him uh, in response to a question from you, Larry. I know you'll appreciate it. Israel Kirzner wrote what I think may be my favorite of all his writings, an essay on the perils of regulation. What a great essay, huh? In which he says that the, one of the big perils of regulation is that 
even when it solves a problem, it solves it permanently. <laughs> which is to say it precludes from then on a better solution. It makes it closes the door forever to any further future innovation that could be uh, a discovery of a much better way to solve the problem than the one you had available in the first place. And it's so with money as well. Even if governments could do a halfway decent job with money, which they can't, uh, we wouldn't have any improvement in the stuff. We would just have, why, well, we still have stagecoach money, or, you know, <laughs> why, it would be so bad, it would be as bad as, uh, as the postal system. Right? There's no innovation. Imagine, do you imagine the post office coming up with, you know, electronic, uh, with email? Right? Yeah. Most of these things are end arounds what government wants you to use because the government's not going to do it itself. Anyway, so the other lesson of the book is if we want a monetary system that's not only sound, but that gets sounder over time, we need to have a private sector doing it. That's the only way it's going to happen. Otherwise, the best we can hope for is that a monetary system that's not bad, you know, in 2013, and the same god, excuse me, <laughs> a god-awful system, can I say that? God-awful system, 200 years later when it's truly decrepit, and you're not going to have any improvement, right? So that's, that's the other lesson I would draw.